Well, thank you so much, uh, Corlin, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, very kind, mostly accurate. Uh, you've done your research. It's, uh, it's really special, uh, meaningful. It's always a pleasure for me to be in the Upper Valley. Uh, as Corlin mentioned, uh, this place is very special for me. Uh, the beautiful Lucy Stringer, whom I married here 10 years ago this past weekend, August 5th, 2007, in Norwich, uh, and is with me today. But, but thank you, uh, Osher, thank you, uh, John and Pete, um, Todd and the team, thank you for getting the AV working. That means I don't have to shout, and so my voice might actually last. Uh, and thank you all of you for, for being here today. I know that uh, John talked about how timely the Russia subject is. Russia is always timely, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, but first, let me say a bit more about who I am. My job, and I do work for a federally funded research institution in Washington. It's a memorial to President Wilson, as well as, of course, to George Kennan the Elder and George F. Kennan. My job is to bring on the ground knowledge and expertise, not always mine, more often not, uh, from the best and the brightest experts around the world on Russia, Ukraine, and other states of the former Soviet Union, uh, to policymakers in Washington, and to you, the American people, who, at the end of the day, like it or lump it, foot the bill. So I guess I'm an expert. Uh, I've been in Russia four times since the beginning of this year, and I'm headed back next month. So what does it mean? to be a Russia expert. What is this expert business all about? I like to start with caveats. What is it that experts actually can't do? <laughs> Turns out there's a lot we can't do. By the way, that cartoon became very popular after the collapse of the Soviet Union when all these people who had studied Russia were suddenly like, well, what are we supposed to do now? <laughs> so here's what we can't do. We can't read anybody's mind. Uh, not least Vladimir Putin, so don't ask. Uh, we tend to be bad at that. We can't tell Russians what their interests are. There is a famous moment uh, in the late 2000s when uh, then-President George W. Bush comes out of a meeting with Vladimir Putin and he remarks to his senior Russia advisor, gosh, that man just doesn't know what his interests are. <laughs> well, <laughs> Vladimir Putin knows exactly what his interests are, he just disagrees with you. And we're very bad at predicting the next crisis. Uh, I remember my uh, former boss and mentor, Jim Collins, uh, who at the time uh, was the charge, who was the deputy chief of the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, and uh, therefore the ranking U.S. diplomat in August of 1991, when the coup against Mikhail Gorbachev essentially began to bring down the Soviet system. And uh, he recalled that earlier that same year, when he had arrived at the embassy, to take up his duties and received a briefing from the very best U.S. intelligence analysts available to the top diplomat in, in Moscow. He was told, sir, uh, based on all the intelligence that we have, our prediction is that by the end of this year, 1991, that the Soviet government will have given the Republic of Estonia limited autonomy. And of course, by December of 1991, the Soviet flag was lowered for the last time over the Tower of the Kremlin and the Soviet Union itself ceased to exist. So we're pretty bad at predicting uh, what's going to happen. Um, what can we do? Well, number one, we can pay attention to how the Russians themselves define their interests. What do they say? What do they do? Why do they say that they do it? Second, we can try to identify patterns and themes and trends in what they say and what they do. And then third, we can help to recall the past, lessons and mistakes and insights that come from what we've seen and what we've done before. Uh, I think here, in a beautiful university town, people maybe are a little bit better at that 10,000-foot perspective, but I can tell you in Washington, D.C., memories are very short, maximum about two years, the political season. So why don't we start with this? Who are Russians? How do they see the world? Well, politics and political cartoons will cast us as diametric opposites. But in actual fact, I'm here to tell you about the many ways in which we are more similar than you might think. Both Russia and the United States, just geographically speaking, are unique as continental nations. We're both Atlantic and Pacific nations. We've both been shaped 
by a continental destiny, what in the United States was called manifest destiny. Go west, my son. What in Russia was the endless expanse of Siberia, which began to be settled in the 16th century. George Kennan the Elder, whom Corlin kindly mentioned, was in fact America's leading Russia expert of the late 19th century. He's written a number of great books that stand the test of time. But how he got into Russia was a unique American and Russian story. In 1865, having been a telegraph operator as an underage, of course, young man during the Civil War, uh, he was hired to help lead an expedition to build a Europe-United States telegraph connection, not under the Atlantic, as we know was eventually completed, but via the Bering Strait. And so he was dispatched to eastern Siberia to explore that route, uh, which he did until several months after the fact they received notice that the Atlantic cable was completed. But he had spent two to three years in eastern Siberia and on that basis became a Russia expert and went back many times. This, I think, is testament to the similarity of experience, the expansion, the movement towards the Pacific that has shaped both nations. And of course, both countries think of themselves as having saved the world or saved Western civilization at least many times. World War II, of course, the anti-Hitler coalition, but even Napoleon, uh, the ravaging armies of Sweden, uh, not a country we think of as being an aggressor today, but uh, 200 years ago it certainly was. Uh, and many other instances throughout European history when the Russians think of themselves exactly as we do today, as the cavalry that has ridden to the rescue of Western civilization. And speaking of civilization, we're both countries that think of themselves as having a unique civilizational mission. In the United States, of course, we are the, sh the shining city on the hill, a phrase dating back to John Winthrop, not so far from here. And the Russians are the third Rome, Tretirim, the heirs of Byzantium, as they think of it, the font and the last bastion of Western civilization and its values. And of course, the Russians would even tell you with a straight face, and they mean it, that they saved the world from communism. No, that's right. And, and the argument basically goes like this. It was not you Americans who brought down the Soviet government. It was us. We tried the system. We endured and we suffered under the system. And we decided it was wrong. It was morally bankrupt and it didn't work. And I think they have a point. So these are the, the many ways in which Russians and Americans are so similar. But of course, we have our differences. And many have talked about a Russian-American values gap. Well, is there a values gap? And if so, what is it? I tend to think, actually, our values are pretty similar. <laughs> Why do I put that up? Our values are pretty similar. Uh, what's different is punctuation, <laughs> emphasis, and sequence. But those things can be important. Ordinary Russian people's values and aspirations, I would say, are broadly similar in, in big baskets to those of ordinary Americans. But please pay attention to the order and to the emphasis, because it matters. Number one, Russians want to live decently. They want stability and prosperity. They even want basic freedoms. And by any of those measures, life in Russia today is far better than it's been at any time in Russian history, and most certainly the most recent time uh, of salient memory, the 1990s. Of course, Russia has a long way to go on development and modernization, but in terms of living decently, жит достойно in Russian, uh, this, is, this is actually not a bad time in Russian history at all. Second, Russians want to be Russian just as we want to be American. But what does that mean to them? It is not exclusive of being European, of being Western, but it is distinct. It means something to be Russian. It means for Russia to be respected for all of its great achievements, literature and art and architecture, all those things that Corlin talked about that brought me and kept me in the field of Russian studies. And oftentimes, it's when Western criticism of Russia takes the tone of disregard. And the relative indifference here in the West to Russia's role in the World War II victory, probably for Russians, the single defining event of the 20th century, that more than anything uh, tends to make Russians feel that their Russian identity is not respected. And then this one might surprise you, but again, pay attention to the sequence. Russians want to be free. Russians value freedom. They have a freedom agenda. But they, they rank and they think of freedom differently than we do often in this country. 
Russians, going back to Soviet times and even Tsarist times, have valued freedom primarily as personal freedom, the freedom to travel, the freedom to speak your mind, the freedom to practice your religion. Think about all of these things. These were sources of the, most, of the strongest opposition to the Soviet system. The fact that Soviet citizens, unless they got a written permit, couldn't leave, couldn't leave the Soviet Union, in some cases couldn't leave their cities, couldn't move to another city. They didn't have the freedom to travel. They certainly didn't have the freedom to speak. The famous case of going into the kitchen and turning on the faucet so it would be ambient noise before you could speak your mind to your friend, the famous kitchen conversations. Uh, and of course, the freedom to practice religion. Russia has been, in many respects, a deeply religious country for centuries. Uh, certainly, they think of themselves as a bastion of Orthodox Christianity, the mother church of Russia. And that could not be practiced freely in Soviet times. So valuing freedom on all of these levels, all of which in greater and lesser degree exist in Russia today. What doesn't exist? Political freedoms. Russians tend not to think of these as the test of freedom. We ask in the United States, do we have freedom? And we think, are you free to go out in the street with a placard that says, the president is a moron? Well, you're not free to do that in Russia. If you do that, you will have problems, if you're seen as a threat. If you're seen as an irrelevant, crazy person, then you're probably fine. The idea is that you have almost complete personal freedom in Russia today, in Russia today and that that is very important for ordinary Russians. But when you protest your government, when you seek to organize a political campaign to bring down Vladimir Putin, that's when you encounter limits. Now, is that important to Russians? Yes. It's important to tens or hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of Russians. But are these the people setting the political agenda? Is this Vladimir Putin's base? Is this the prototypical ordinary Russian? No, it's not. And that is why the system that seems so different from ours in many ways is just about a different order, a different sequence, and a different emphasis. And I would note, as an aside, we can talk more about this, that in the era of social media, in the age when a single posting on Facebook or Twitter, which to you may be simply expressing your personal opinion, can go viral and overnight can get 10,000 or 100,000 people clicking, I like this, forwarding it to others, that can meld personal and political freedoms in an interesting way that I think will challenge this framework. Now that's how ordinary folks see the world in Russia. What about the Russian political elite? They have a very distinct worldview that's been shaped by experience and other factors. First of all, think about who these folks are generationally. So if you talk about the generation of people who are broadly speaking between their mid-50s and their mid-70s today, that is the generation of power in the Kremlin and in Moscow, subtract 25 or 30 years from their age, where were they? They were in their mid to late 20s, into their 30s, and maybe early 40s in 1989 to 1991. And what happened to those people? Everything that they knew, everything that they had served, everything that they had sought to build in their early education and their upbringing suddenly disappeared around them and collapsed. These are the people who are in power today. Whether they were the industrial elite of the Soviet Union, the military elite, the secret police elite like Vladimir Putin, the scientific elite, the diplomatic elite, they lost everything. They lost status, they lost respect, they lost salary, they lost pension, they lost access to goods and health care, the ability to take care of their families, their elderly parents, whatever it may have been, all gone overnight. Think about what that does to your perspective on the world. What kind of place this world is that we live in. Everything you know can disappear radically overnight and apparently to you for no good reason at all. So these are people who by and large see the world as a scary and a dangerous place where bad things can and do happen and where your primary mission is to protect yourself and those you care about from the consequences of those bad things. Moreover, and come back to the idea of Russians wanting to be Russian and wanting to be respected as being Russian, there was a palpable sense to these people, and I don't think that they were totally wrong, that we in the West and in the United States in particular felt a kind of schadenfreude as they were experiencing this. It's not that we wanted them to suffer, but simply we said, look, you're on the losing end of history. You, specifically you, with the red stars on your caps and the, and the shoulder boards, you're the bad guys. You're the enemy. You're the oppressor. So of course you lost. 
and of course you are losing everything. It's your just dessert. How do you think that feels to those people who are now in power in Russia today? But it's not only the experience of the Soviet collapse. Everything that the, that the Russian state can do, can achieve, and can build today depends essentially on one thing, and that is the price of commodities, the price of the export of energy in Russia. Here you can see the correlation between Russian GDP growth and the price of energy on the international market. Now, if there's one thing that we know about the price of energy, one thing we can say with certainty, and there's only one thing, that it will fluctuate and that it's unpredictable. And so that means everything you can do in the Russian state and with the Russian state budget depends on one thing, and that thing is unpredictable. Again, underscoring that the world is an unpredictable and dangerous place where you have to be prepared for the worst. And then, of course, there is the vertical of power. What has Vladimir Putin primarily done since he came to power in 1999 and 2000? He has restored the primacy of the Russian state. And not just a state in the sense that we think about it here in the United States, you know, a piece of territory, some bureaucrats in a building, maybe a police officer. The state has an almost sacred status in Russia. The idea is that the very existence of Russia, Russia's continuity, this vast, multi-ethnic, continental place, 145 million people surrounded by uh, powerful and often hostile nations, that it can exist it doesn't spin apart from the inside, and it doesn't collapse from external pressure or of its own weight, only because of the primacy of the state. And so in Vladimir Putin's restoration of the state, he has eliminated or prevented from developing in the first place what we think of as civil society or the private sector or the church, churches. These things all exist but in a form where they are subservient to the state. They are part of a vertical of power. And what does that mean? It means that Russia's recovery, its prestige, its very existence is far less resilient than it would be if you had a kind of portfolio theory. Think about the Hurricane Katrina disaster here in the United States, where local authorities are overwhelmed, and state authorities, and even federal authorities. Who comes out of the woodwork to help? Church groups, NGOs, businesses, Right? This is the pluralism effect, the portfolio effect of civil society, and the current Russian power system has none of that. So it is brittle. If there is a threat to Russian state power, it is a threat to the existence of the state itself. And again, it makes the world a very scary and a dangerous place where your primary job is to prepare for disaster, to prevent it, and to be ready to protect yourself. So what kind of worldview in political or policy terms does this give rise to for this Russian elite that we're talking about? Well, they tend not to see themselves as a superpower, as many of us would imagine. They are hard-nosed realists. They understand exactly how their power stacks up in the world. But they nonetheless wish to be at the top table. They want to be, if you will, on the board of directors for international events. And they're willing to make deals, like any hard-nosed realist or good businessman. And they like to make deals if they can with the West, with Europe, with the United States, their very favorite partner. After all, we're the richest and the most powerful. Why would they not want to make deals with us? But they'll never sacrifice as a cost of doing business their independent foreign policy. In other words, if our message to the Russians is, we won't talk to you, we won't do business until you agree with us, the answer to that will always be no from Moscow. Moreover, the Russians recognize that unlike during the Cold War, they cannot be the senior partner to China anymore. China is bigger, wealthier, perhaps even more powerful militarily today. And the test was when Russia invaded Georgia in 2008 and then afterwards recognized the independence of the Georgian breakaway republics and asked their Chinese friends and partners, once their fellow communist fellow travelers, can you please recognize these states? And the Chinese said, no, thank you. As a result, the Russians most appreciate being a kind of middleman, a broker, a key player, a keystone in the arch. You think about the Iran nuclear deal, Syria, even Ukraine, any number of international events in which Russia is the key player, necessary, though perhaps not sufficient. And then, of course, the Russians believe that they are rational. They believe they are rational actors 
whereas others, especially us here in the United States, are more influenced by politics or some kind of uh, millennic, uh, millenarian uh, hi hypocrisy. The United States on human rights, for instance. And indeed, they have a point. Uh, we made rather a, a giant cause celeb out of these ladies here uh, known as Pussy Riot. I'm sorry, that's the name of their punk rock group. Uh, there they are filming a profanity-laden music video um, called Four-Letter Word Putin uh, on the holy altar of the Christ the Savior Cathedral in the center of Moscow. They received for this two years in prison, um, perhaps a harsh sentence, but it was in one instance uh, in a country of 145 million people. And this became a giant cause celeb in the United States and in Washington. You probably saw these women. Um, how much do we talk about the plight of women in the Arab world, uh, in our friend Saudi Arabia? Uh, not very much, and the Russians like to point to this. Uh, our obsession with Iran's nuclear program, certainly a threat, certainly a threat to global and regional security, no question, compared to 1998. Uh, Bill Perry may have mentioned this, when Pakistan went nuclear, and it was barely a blip for the United States. This is Pakistan, people, a country whose intelligence service is known to be in bed with Islamic radicals, which borders on Afghanistan, which is where bin Laden was hiding out, probably known to the Pakistani leadership. And they went nuclear in 1998, and it was barely a blip for the United States. So the, again, the Russians think our priorities are all backwards. Or why, for example, is the prominence of radical, uh, oftentimes uh, racist or even neo-Nazi nationalists in Central and Eastern Europe, our NATO allies, uh, why is this perhaps not desirable, but ultimately acceptable in American politics, whereas the slightest hint of nationalism in Russia uh, tends to get our goat? And again, the Russians say, uh, why are you hypocritical about this? But of course, Russia matters to us, uh, so we can't just agree to disagree and go our separate ways. John, as I said, uh, described the Russia topic as timely. Russia is always timely. It is the one country on Earth that can destroy life as we know it in the United States in under an hour. That is not an exaggeration. North Korea is a problem. Iran is a problem. The leaders of North Korea and Iran don't have the power to destroy life as we know it in the United States in under an hour. Vladimir Putin has that power. So Russia's nuclear arsenal makes it the only real existential threat to the United States at this moment. That means Russia matters. It is also the second largest supplier of conventional weapons in the world, after the United States, of course. If you think international law matters, if you think international institutions matter, Russia has to be at the table. It is a member of the United Nations Security Council. It has been the critical vote on sanctions for Libya, Iran, most recently North Korea. And as I mentioned, Russia may not be sufficient to solve any of these international problems, but it is certainly necessary. If the Russians are not at the table, then they will be spoilers. Then they will make a solution impossible. Think about 21st century challenges. I know that you'll hear about climate change in your next lecture. But not only that, health challenges, disaster relief, cybercrime, trafficking. The Russians, for many reasons, some of them historical, some of them about Russia's ambition to be a global player, punch far above their weight. They have capabilities to project power around the world, to do disaster relief, to do international health operations, to do trafficking and interdiction. Think of Russian ships combating Somali pirates off the Horn of Africa. They have capabilities that a comparable size nation in terms of GDP or population like a Brazil or a France simply doesn't have. And it's because the Russians have the ambition to be relevant. And so they are. And then, of course, Russia's physical size. It spans 11 time zones. It borders on Central Asia and East Asia. You know, I remember in Europe, of course, I remember when President Obama famously said a couple of years ago, oh, Russia's just a regional power. This was part of his, what I uh, uh, called at the time, uh, the diminishment strategy of Russia. And the Russian ambassador then famously reacted, I thought, quite cleverly and said, yes, we agree. Russia is a regional power as long as we agree that the region spans from the Sea of Japan to the Baltic and from the Arctic to the Middle East. <laughs>
to more or less half the world. Russia's environment matters. Its forests are critical to renewing breathable atmosphere on this planet. More than 20% of the world's unfrozen fresh water is in Lake Baikal alone. And of course, natural resources, foremost being energy. These figures are a little bit dated. The numbers are not vitally important. But suffice it to say, even if Europe shifts away from dependence on Russian gas, which it will never be able to do completely, or not for a very long time, it's fungible. So Russia won't send gas to Europe. It will send it instead to China and Japan and Korea. Right? Russia is an energy superpower, and it will be. And of course, the Russian Arctic. I go back for a moment to this slide. There's a lot of good research that tells us today that the Russian Arctic is not about to become the new transshipment route, so let's not have fantasies that your next iPhone is going to be sent to you via the Arctic. There are plenty of faster and more efficient and less dangerous ways to go. But it is true as that our planet's climate changes. The Arctic shipping route is going to be more available and more prominent. Energy is going to be accessed from that region, and those routes are going to have to be protected. And that means that among the small handful of Arctic powers in the world is Russia and the United States. And we're going to have to talk to each other. And then there's the economic opportunity. The size of the Russian market alone. It's the single biggest market in Europe, 145 million people, uh, many of whom are much better off than you might think, and who love consuming American products. Depending on how you measure, Russia is either the sixth or the twelfth largest world market. Depends on purchasing power parity versus absolute terms. Uh, it's foreign currency reserves, which are down as a result of the recent economic crisis, but they've been down before and back up, are something on the order of between three and seven hundred billion dollars, depending on how you measure, so among the largest in the world. Uh, and Russians love to buy American products, especially American luxury products. Ford was the best selling foreign car brand in Russia for three years, and it's not even really foreign because Fords are now manufactured in Russia. Just like plenty of other Russian products, including uh, plenty of other American products, including Boeing, which has a research and development center uh, just outside of Moscow that allows R&D to take place 24-7, right? Starting in, uh, in, well, depending on how you count the clock, but starting in Seattle and Chicago and then Moscow, where you have high-quality IT engineers and, and uh, even Soviet space program trained aerospace engineers working 24-7 to build American aircraft. Boeing signed a $50 billion deal with Russia in 2010, the same year that Pepsi bought Wimbledon for $5.5 billion. That's Russia's largest producer of soft drinks. And then in 2013, of course, Exxon famously inked a deal with Rosneft, Russia's largest oil producer, to explore 85 billion barrels of oil drilling in the Arctic. That deal, by the way, was signed by Rex Tillerson now our Secretary of State. And I should note as an aside, Exxon is currently suing the Treasury Department because the Treasury Department about a month ago imposed a $2 million fine on Exxon for violating sanctions and signing that deal. Sort of an illustration of the dysfunction of our Russia policy in the United States. So what the heck is going on? Why are we in this conflict with Russia? And is it a path to a new Cold War or are we already in a new Cold War? Well, the answer, like so many things, is yes and no. What Corlin didn't mention is I am a lawyer by education, so you'll never get a straight answer from me. <laughs> there are many ways in which the situation today is similar to a Cold War. There's been a shift in rhetoric. We see high levels of propaganda on both sides, demonization of the other side, what I call boogeymanism, if you think about the way that Vladimir Putin is caricatured in the American media but the same was and is true of American leaders in the Russian press. The narrative on both sides, if you really think about it, is that the other is solely at fault for provoking the conflict that we are in. We clearly have low expectations for cooperation. We simply don't think the other side can deliver anything of value, anything that matters to us. And we engage in tit-for-tat punishment of one another. The so-called isolation policy, right? Yeah, yeah, we're not going to talk to you. You don't get to be in the G8 anymore. You don't get to sit at the big boy table. Uh, canceling institutions like this, the Bilateral Presidential Commission, uh, which, by the way, was not the first of its kind. 
We've had bilateral commissions with the Soviets going back to the 1970s and 80s. And every time we have a disagreement with them, we throw the baby out with the bathwater. We say, we don't want to talk to you anymore. We don't want to have meetings anymore. We're going to delete your phone number from our cell phone. Of course, sanctions and counter sanctions, most famously 700 employees of the U.S. Embassy in Moscow now have to be fired. The U.S. diplomats can no longer go to their dacha complex, their weekend house, if you will, because the Russians have been kicked out of theirs in New York and Maryland. And there will always be a Russian response. The Russians are not going to stand idly by as we impose penalties on them and simply, you know, tail between legs, come crawling back, asking for forgiveness. That's not the way it works in this relationship. We've frozen almost all of our bilateral dialogues with the Russians, not just this bilateral commission, but also the NATO-Russia Council. Why did we create the NATO-Russia Council, by the way? To have nice, happy conversations with the Russians? No, to prevent a security disaster in Europe. So stopping dialogue in the NATO-Russia Council because we have security problems doesn't make a lot of sense. And despite all of this, we're still cooperating with the Russians in space. I remember not that long ago, kind of similar to the movie The Martian, where a guy gets abandoned on Mars. We had an American and a Russian and a Kazakh, by the way, who was almost totally forgotten about, in the International Space Station for a year, a year in space, right? And that was exactly the year when the whole crisis in U.S.-Russia relations exploded and we decided in our infinite wisdom here on the ground that we were going to stop talking to each other. And I just kept having this recurring nightmare that these poor astronauts were going to get completely abandoned, hurtling around the planet in space. Hello, Houston. Hello. We have a problem. Uh, and, of course, we are still talking to each other on many important issues. The Iran nuclear deal was signed in 2015. Wouldn't have been possible without Russia. That's after the Ukraine crisis broke out. Uh, the Arctic Council continues to meet. But we have some very, very serious risk factors. Like in the Cold War, we are engaging in proxy conflicts. What is a proxy conflict? Well, as distinct from a direct conflict, it's one in which international players align on two or more sides, and they fight one another indirectly. And that's happening now, of course, in Syria, but in Ukraine as well and other places. This is uh, footage of the shoot-down of a Russian fighter plane, not, not a, a Russian-supplied Syrian fighter, but a Russian fighter plane uh, in the sky over the Turkey-Syria border region in 2015, shot down by Turkey, which is a NATO ally. That means it's an American ally. So they shot down a Russian plane in 2015. Uh, within a year, though, Russia and Turkey had mended ties, repaired relations, so that was okay. This happened about a month ago. This was much, much less okay. Um, you can see here the wing of the Russian defense minister's transport aircraft. So the Russian minister of defense, uh, a guy called Shoigu, is a former fireman, by the way, beloved figure, very respected in Russia, is about five years younger than Putin, He's viewed, for now at least, as the only potential credible successor to Vladimir Putin. So the crown prince of Russia, if you will, is flying in international airspace on a transport aircraft trying to get from Moscow to Kaliningrad, which is a Russian exclave surrounded by Poland and Lithuania, both member, NATO member countries. And uh, the Polish Air Force decides to send an F-16 up to intercept him. Not a good idea. Not a good idea. And immediately, of course, a Russian Sukhoi fighter plane, fully armed, flies in between them. This is all dangerous aerial acrobatic maneuvers, and he kind of wiggles his wings or does whatever it is that you know, Top Gun types do to signal, I'm going to shoot you down if you don't get out of here. Um, this is happening. This is real. And this is incredibly, incredibly dangerous. Can you imagine that? If the defense minister of Russia's aircraft had been just maybe accidentally interfered with some kind of aerial disturbance as a result of the jet engines of the, of the F-16 aircraft. And again, Poland's a NATO member country. This is an ally of the United States. This is what I mean by proxy conflict and danger. It's not just the Baltic region. It's not just Ukraine. It's not just Syria. We're fighting one another for influence throughout the post-Soviet space, Belarus, Kazakhstan. Think about European countries, Greece, Hungary, even France and Germany, Latin America, Venezuela, right? There are contests for influence through economic power, 
political leverage, military supplies, civilian nuclear programs. All of these things are clearly reminiscent of the Cold War, and it's very, very scary. So these are ways in which the current situation is similar. How is it different? Well, for one thing, we're coming out of a period of unprecedented global engagement between Russia and the West and the United States in particular. Post-Soviet Russia, as I talked about a little bit earlier, has been much freer, radically freer than the Soviet Union, despite real limitations. And I think a great illustration of this is the case of Boris Berezovsky. He was the kingmaker. This guy was an oligarch in Yeltsin's Russia who basically brought Putin to power. That's how he writes it in his autobiography anyway. He says he basically was the one who introduced Putin to the Yeltsin family, brought him into the inner circle. Well, he fell out of favor in the 2000s, and he removed himself with some of his billions to London, where he lived rather comfortably. What this illustrates, until, by the way, he turned up dead mysteriously, and we still don't know why. <laughs> but what this illustrates is the genius of Putin's system is he's not trying to do what the Soviets did. He's not, as Brezhnev did, saying, if you disagree, we're going to put you in prison in Siberia, and you can't leave. He's saying, if you disagree, here's the door. Get out of here, right? It's a fundamentally different system from the Cold War where they were behind an iron curtain. The post-Cold War generation in Russia has real connections with the wider world. So many of them have gone to be educated or to work in Europe or the United States, even East Asia, and then they go back home to Russia. This is not like the Cold War. They are not a captive prisoner population. They choose to be in Russia. They want to be Russian. So very different. There's no global ideological struggle as there was between Russia and the United States in the Cold War. We basically agree on free market capitalism. We have differences of interpretation. How important should state companies be? How big should the role of the state be in industry? But we basically agree about that. And we even agree about democracy in its broadest sense. What we tend to disagree about are the details. What does a free election mean? How many terms can a president serve? How much power should a president have versus a legislature? And the Russians love to remind us it's only been 25 years. They are a young democracy. So where was the United States 25 years after our creation as democracy? 1801, 1802, probably not a shining moment for American democracy. It's the Trail of Tears in 1830, slavery, which wasn't eliminated until the Civil War, votes for women, not till 1920, the Civil Rights Act, not till 1964. So a little perspective, I think, when you kind of compare the inadequacy of Russia's democracy to American democracy today is useful. But the idea is that we're not fighting about whether the world should be communist or capitalist. There's no global, all-consuming ideological struggle where each side knows all the right answers for everybody and is trying to defeat the other. Perhaps most importantly is that there is a massive power imbalance between the United States and Russia today. The United States, is a simple fact, is coming off of a quarter century of unrivaled hyperpower status. We are not in the habit of acknowledging anyone else as being a peer or a near peer rival of ours and therefore of having to defer to their interests or make concessions of any kind. It simply isn't something we have had to do for a quarter of a century, and it's worked just fine for us. But if you think about the situation during the Cold War, and again, we're doing analysis here, folks, right? We're trying to compare how is today like the Cold War and how is it different? Well, it's different in that if you think about US GDP in 1980, for instance, it was a couple of trillion dollars. And Soviet GDP, depending on how you measured it, remember it was a largely non-monetized economy, was pretty similar. It was maybe one and a half or two trillion, or maybe we were at two and a half or three trillion. So, but we were roughly, roughly in parity. If you think about uh, NATO and American military power during the Cold War versus Soviet and Warsaw Pact military power, again, rough, rough parity. You know, most of our forces were over here in the United States, not forward deployed in Europe. So it meant that the Soviets were actually more powerful on the ground in Europe, but you know, we had the nuclear relationship and we had the ability to back up our European allies on short notice. On both of those measures today, it is an order of magnitude difference. The United States economy is, what, 20 trillion 
and the Russians is one, maybe one and a half, depending on how you count. You think about the power of NATO, an alliance which has more or less doubled in the last 25 years, versus the power of Russia and its one lonely ally, Belarus, there is no comparison. It's a 20-fold superiority, if not more. Now, why is this important, right? Because it makes, it makes us feel good, because we're big and tough and strong. It doesn't change the problems that we have. It matters because of the perceived risks. Risks and fear which concentrate the mind. If we are honest with ourselves, and this may be changing at this moment when we're facing a potential nuclear crisis on the Korean Peninsula, but if we're honest with ourselves and we ask, how real do we think the possibility that we will be in a nuclear war with Russia today or tomorrow or this week, do we think that that's real? If we're honest with ourselves, most Americans, and in particular, most younger Americans, wouldn't even know what you're talking about. Now, that's very different from the experience of the Cold War. And the reason that I include this in my comparison is that most of all, it means we lack rational fear as a motivation to do diplomacy with Russia. And that is an incredibly important difference, which actually makes the world, ironically, more dangerous and not less. All right, so let me back up for a moment, and this is what I call 25 years of history in two and a half minutes. How did we get to where we are? Well, in the 1990s, of course, yeah, I call it the Bill and Boris show, they did a lot of laughing and a lot of backslapping, two big bears of men, um, popular elected politicians. The, the sort of strategy of U.S. relations with Russia in the 1990s was a strategic alliance with Russian reform. The idea being Russia is becoming a democracy like us. We should support that. We should be friends. And Boris Yeltsin, in fact, becomes the embodiment of Russian democracy for much of the policymaking class in the United States. And so when Boris Yeltsin, who by then is already suffering from his famous problems with drink and other related health problems, uh, barely, if you'll recall, being able to stumble off of an airplane, once not even getting off the airplane, actually, uh, just sort of ditching a summit with the president of Ireland because he could not get off his aircraft. He was so drunk and so ill. Um, we nonetheless support him in his bid for re-election in 1996, thinking to ourselves, perhaps rationally at the time, that if Yeltsin didn't win, well, then a communist would come back to power in Russia or some kind of nationalist or some other clown who would be far worse for American national interests. We pursued enlargement of the NATO alliance, by the way, just a little, uh, little note for, uh, for uh, those of you who want to be policy nerds. Anybody who says NATO expansion, that is generally uh, interpreted negatively. So when you ask Admiral Stavridis a question about NATO enlargement, use the word enlargement. He'll appreciate that, and he'll say, oh, this person knows what they're talking about. It's a term of art. I worked briefly at the NATO Defense College. That's why I learned that. In 1999, an enlarged NATO bombed Yugoslavia, Belgrade, historically very close to Russia. There was a famous instance where uh, then Prime Minister Yevgeny Primakov of Russia, uh, a former, let's just say, well-connected expert in the Russian security uh, apparatus, who was an expert on the Middle East, very well regarded in Russia, uh, foreign policy expert. He was headed to the United States in 1999 for consultations about the Yugoslav crisis. And he finds out while he's on the airplane that the United States has begun bombing Belgrade without notifying or consulting the Russians. And he orders his aircraft to be turned around over the Atlantic. And that was the first major rift in the post-Cold War U.S.-Russia relationship. And then, of course, there's this phenomenon, color revolutions. Color revolutions beginning in the early 2000s in Georgia, in Kyrgyzstan, and Ukraine, the first orange revolution there. Further rounds of NATO enlargement in the mid-2000s. The war in Georgia in 2008. And then, of course, the reset, right? 2009, President Obama comes to office. What about the reset? Everything is good again, right? Not so much. By 2011, when, of course, Dmitry Medvedev is president of Russia, that was Vladimir Putin's pal and prime minister before, he essentially is handpicked as president runs for election, wins, 
in 2007, serves until 2012, and in 2011, late 2011, Putin and Medvedev, in a carefully orchestrated public rally, come out together on the stage, and Medvedev announces, almost as sort of Putin's creature, he says, I would like to nominate Vladimir Putin to succeed me as president. And protests break out across Russia of people saying, hey, we don't want to be potted plants or stage props in our own democracy. Again, the idea that Russians actually do care about this stuff. Uh, you don't get to just tell us who is going to be president. We pick the president. And this becomes known as the white protest movement, and this is the movement for which Vladimir Putin now famously blames Hillary Clinton as having organized this protest movement. Now, Hillary probably didn't have a lot to do with organizing it, but it is true that there were plenty of American consultants and NGO types and uh, other, other uh, activists and observers who were engaged in Russia for many years who certainly would have been very supportive of a protest against Putin and the Putin regime. And then we had the probably not great judgment to send Mike McFall, a noted Russia expert from Stanford, uh, high regard for his, for his Russian knowledge, probably bad timing to send him as the new ambassador to Russia uh, between late 2011 and early 2012 while the protests are going on. He wrote a book called Russia's Unfinished Revolution. Uh, it was known as a democracy expert, probably not the guy the Russians want to see turning up right in the middle of a massive protest movement on the streets uh, of Moscow and St. Petersburg and other major cities. And of course, he's hounded by the Russian press and mistreated uh, and uh, does not have a very good experience as ambassador as a result. You'll remember this guy, Sergei Magnitsky, who turns up dead in a Russian prison in 2008, having worked for a prominent American investor, Bill Browder. Well, 2012, post-reset, before the Ukraine crisis, long before Ukraine breaks, the United States Congress passes the so-called Magnitsky Sanctions Act as a replacement for the then three-decade-old Jackson Vanek sanctions, which those of you may recall were imposed on the Soviet Union because it restricted emigration of Jews and other dissidents from the Soviet Union in the 1970s and 80s. Well, the Russian perception of this was, hang on. So the Soviet Union hasn't existed since 1991, but you've kept this Jackson Vanek sanctions on the, book, on the books until 2012. And now, as a condition for getting rid of Jackson Vanek, you're going to pick this, this one guy, this one lawyer who died in prison, and you're going to impose new sanctions on us? Well, that's exactly what we did. And those sanctions are still on the book. And in fact, as of a couple of weeks ago, those sanctions have been expanded thanks to a new act of Congress. Oh, then there's this guy, our friend Edward Snowden. Remember him? Just happened to show up in Moscow exactly at that time. So all of this is before the Ukraine crisis and after the reset. Not a very good time in US-Russia relations, unfortunately. Lots was achieved under the reset. I don't want to minimize it. but. In retrospect, it certainly doesn't seem that we were on the path to uh, radical improvement in relations. Well, then what happens? Late 2013, we actually were living in Kiev just before this broke out. Uh, Ukrainians confronted by the truly titanic corruption of the Yanukovych government uh, come out in protests on the streets of Kiev when Yanukovych says, instead of signing up to the European Union's so-called association process. It's not quite European membership, but it's sort of EU light. Uh, we are instead uh, going to wait, and we'll sort of flirt with Russia, and uh, we won't do the reforms that the European Union wants us to do. Well, Ukrainians come out en masse, and then when, in their idiocy, the Ukrainian government orders troops to clear the Maidan. Maidan just means square in Ukrainian. Uh, the protests turn quite nasty. They run through uh, the fall and winter and into early 2014. And the key message here is that this, this Ukraine crisis, which certainly became a crisis by early 2014, uh, was not initially about U.S.-Russia conflict. This is not a Cold War-style proxy conflict until much later. It was about Ukrainian problems. It was about corruption in Ukraine and the dysfunction of the Yanukovych regime and the distrust between the people uh, and the government and the tension between eastern Ukraine, which is broadly speaking sort of Russian and, and even Soviet in its orientation, and western Ukraine, which never lived under the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union, until after World War II. These are all Ukrainian problems. 
But by 2014, they become part of the geopolitical conflict between Russia and the West. And there's plenty of blame to go around in this crisis. There's a, a book written by a couple of colleagues of mine called The Ukraine Crisis, Everybody Loses, and that certainly is a correct characterization. But I think the question that matters most, you know about the little green men who show up in Crimea, first the Russians deny that they're Russian, and then they say proudly, oh yeah, of course they're Russian, they were there to prevent genocide, right? Well, what genocide? It's like saying, you know, my watch keeps tigers away. Do you see any tigers? Uh, well, the, thanks to the little green men, Crimea is now Russian. It has been annexed and seized. And that's part of why this Ukraine crisis that broke out in 2013-14, why it matters so much. I mean, why do we talk so much about that, and why was that such a breaking point in 25 years of what I hope I've shown you in two and a half minutes, maybe a little more than that, uh, were already pretty dysfunctional. But why was Ukraine such a breaking point? Well, let's go to the primary sources. This is how we do good policy analysis. Russia's actions in Ukraine challenge the post-World War II world order. That's President Obama. Another quote, the United States stands with Ukraine in the face of the threats to sovereignty, to international law, and to the international order. That's Defense Secretary James Mattis. Then there's another one. This is an attempt to perturb the existing world order with one incontestable leader who wants to remain as such, thinking he is allowed everything, while others are only allowed what he allows and only in his interests. This world order will never suit Russia. That, of course, Vladimir Putin. So, on both sides, the talk is about world order. Ukraine is about world order. What the heck is world order? What does world order mean? Well, I submit to you that world order is not an abstraction. It is what countries do. And the countries that have mattered most of all for world order in the last hundred years have been the countries of Europe and North America. That is a simple statement of fact. It may be that 50 years from now, it is China and Brazil and India that determine what world order is by their actions. The fact of the matter is, when there is order in Europe, when there are rules in Europe, then there is, broadly speaking, greater order and greater rules in the world. And when there is chaos in Europe, then there is not. And the biggest moment of attempted order setting and rule setting in Europe came in 1975 the famous Helsinki Final Act, based on a series of meetings that ran in lovely places like Vienna and Helsinki and Geneva for five years up to 1975. And the Helsinki Final Act was a simple deal. It was a bargain. It said from the Western side, we recognize the reality that the Soviet Union exists, right? Which had been very difficult for us collectively to acknowledge since the Russian Revolution in 1917. We recognize the de facto territorial changes as a result of World War II and the fact that the Red Army occupied everything from the Elba River eastward. We recognize that Poland has moved 500 miles, Czechoslovakia has changed, all these borders have changed. And we're going to agree on some basic rules for how people ought to be treated so that you don't just get to throw up a wall that says, ah, sovereignty, sovereignty. You don't get to tell us how we treat our domestic population what kind of rights people should have in terms of religion or travel, uh, trade, investment, and so on. And the grand symbolism of this is an organization now called the OSCE, or Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Sadly, it is thought of in the American context as just another one of these irrelevant alphabet soup institutions, uh, which is really a shame. Uh, because, and the symbolism of this is that it sits in the Hofburg, the former uh, palace of the Habsburg Empire in Vienna, uh, this is the essence of European order, European security. Do we have it or do we not have it? It is the only organization, the only regional security organization, of which both Russia and its allies and the United States and its NATO allies are members. There are 57 members of the OSCE. And by and large, we are locked in constant disagreement with one another, and it is another institution that doesn't work. And why does all this matter? It matters because when there are no rules in Europe, when there is disorder in Europe, People die. Think about World War II and all of the consequences of the current conflict. I don't know if this image reminds you of the migrant crisis that we see in Europe today. It should. European institutions are not working to manage not only Europe's problems, but the consequences 
of wider global problems. So that is why the Ukraine crisis matters. It matters because of Ukraine, but it also matters because of European order and world order. This is the moment where the emperor has no clothes, where we realize that the rules and the system and the norms that we thought we built after 1945 simply don't exist. So what do we do about it? Well, I like to go back to George Kennan, not only because it's where my paycheck comes from, but I actually think he had it right. If you go back to the 1946 long telegram that George Kennan famously wrote from the U.S. Embassy in Moscow and sent back to Washington and is thought of as the defining document of U.S. strategy and policy during the Cold War, there are five recommendations at the end of that document, most of which are just as relevant today. But two of those recommendations focus on the idea of knowing Russia, understanding not the Soviet Union as an abstract enemy, right, as a political construct of Stalin and his Bolsheviks, but as Russia, know Russia. A simple idea. Those are his two big recommendations out of five in the long telegram. You can't practice containment or any other policy towards Russia if you don't know what Russia is. And I have to give you the sad reality that we in the United States increasingly don't know what Russia is. Since the end of the Cold War, we have barely supported and barely educated Russian experts in this country. These are facts. Four PhDs in economics, five in sociology with focuses on Russia since 2009, almost a decade ago. And of these nine newly minted Russia experts, how many of them do you think are interested in going to Washington, being what it is today? Probably not many. I, I hope a few. Uh, our programming, U.S. government-sponsored programming to support Russian area studies has collapsed. The so-called Title VI program, which supports not just Russian area studies, but all area studies across U.S. universities, rather a modest program, a hundred and some million dollars, uh, now down to just over $50 million. Uh, the Russian area studies programs at, numbers, uh, at numerous universities have been shut down as a result of the declining support. And then this, exchange programs, uh, the numbers of people from Russia and the former Soviet Union that we can afford uh, under U.S. government-sponsored programs to bring to the United States, also down. This was something that happened just after I took over at the Kennan Institute, which is one of the main uh, administrators of this, uh, of this federally funded program, just about $5 million had been spent since the 1970s on a program called Title VIII. The name's not important, but the alumni of that program include people like Madeleine Albright and Condoleezza Rice, uh, many of our U.S. ambassadors and Russia specialists over the years. I am a product of that program. It's basically federal funding that allows you, among other things, to study Russian language and do research trips to Russia and so forth. Uh, in its infinite wisdom, the U.S. Congress eliminated that program completely in 2012. Remember, I told you what was going on in 2012, right? Was that an unimportant moment in U.S.-Russia relations? I would think not. But I received a letter in October of 2012 saying this program is gone. And then the Congress brought it back, but not at $5 million, instead at $1.3 million, and that's where we are today. Uh, so that is our support for Russian area studies in the United States. I would suggest George Kennan is probably rolling over in his grave thinking about this reality. And of course, if we want to change relations between Russia, we need to think about the foundations. Institutions matter. But don't try to change Russia. Efforts to change Russia historically, just speaking analytically, have almost always backfired. The 1990s, think about the election of Boris Yeltsin, right? We look at the field of candidates and we say, well, we don't like the communist and we don't like the nationalist. We don't love Yeltsin, but he's our best bet, right? So we work as hard as we can. It doesn't mean that we flip the outcome of the Russian election, but Yeltsin was polling at 3% going into the 1996 election. He gets elected. He can barely survive his second term as president. And what do we end up with? He appoints Vladimir Putin as his successor. So I don't think it's a, a far stretch to say that part of the reason Vladimir Putin is in power in Russia today is that we strongly supported Boris Yeltsin's re-election to president in 1996. So efforts to change Russian politics probably are going to backfire. And in fact, the, when the shoe's on the other foot, if Vladimir Putin has attempted to intervene in American politics, change American politics, 
he might be regretting that decision now. I don't think American politics are looking very favorable for Vladimir Putin as a result of Russian intervention. So what do we do instead? Focus on incentives. Focus on behavior, not on politics. How do we change incentives to deter behavior we don't like? How do we incentivize behavior that we do like? And again, foundations. If we're going to impose pressure on Russia, if we're going to punish Russia, think about Archimedes. He said, give me a long enough lever and a place to stand, and I can move the world. Right? But you've got to have the lever, and you've got to have the place to stand. So what that means is, if we don't have an economic relationship, if we're not doing any trade with Russia in the first place, if we're not selling Fords and building Boeings and buying Russian drink manufacturers and trading in the Russian stock market, what possible effect are our sanctions going to have? Well, the bad news there is that the U.S.-Russia relationship, 25 years after the Cold War, is the economic relationship is tiny. It's actually collapsed over the last four years from a high of about $45 billion down to less than $20 billion today. Where is the platform? Where is the lever? People-to-people -people relations, increasingly attenuated. It is becoming increasingly difficult to get visas. We had a, a three-year multi-entry visa agreement in place as of 2012, and technically that agreement is still in place. Uh, I have one of those visas. I'm very, very grateful for it. Uh, you used to have to submit a urine sample to get a visa. To, I'm not making this up. By the way, why did you have to submit a urine sample? It was about proving that you didn't have HIV. Why did you have to prove to the Russians you didn't have HIV? Because we required that the Russians prove that they didn't have HIV. Tit for tat, mirror image. The Russian form is a direct translation of the U.S. form, and it always will be. But now, because of the Russian retaliation kicking out American embassy staff, the latest news I have from friends working on getting visas is that they're scheduling initial interviews to get those visas for late October. Okay, so you can't even get your interview now for several months, and whether it even happens then is unclear. So we need to fix the people-to-people -people foundation of the relationship, the official track, trade, if we want to have leverage, a platform, a place to stand. And then, of course, we have to talk to Russia about the difficult issues. Don't just look for good conversations, right? This is a habit we've had over 25 years. When things are going badly, we are always looking for opportunities to talk about good things. Talk about the hard issues. You want to talk about human rights in Russia? Talk about the International Convention, the European Convention on Human Rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You want to talk about European security? Talk about the dysfunction of European security. Don't only look for good conversations. And talk about reciprocal commitments. Right? The Vienna Conventions, uh, the Helsinki Final Act, the WTO Agreement. Right? They've made commitments, we've made commitments. And talk about the interests of our citizens. Today, unlike during the Cold War, there are thousands of Americans living and doing business in Russia. Right? We can assert their interests very legitimately in the eyes of Russians, rather than saying, we, we think this is how you should live. Right? We think what you're doing to your own citizens is bad. You should do something different. That doesn't go over very well with Russians, but we can tell them what's important for our people. And then, of course, we need to give them a lot more transparency about how our system works. Russians don't understand the Congress and the relationship between the Congress and the president. So when John McCain goes to Georgia and gives a speech, the Russians assume, well, Barack Obama must have sent him there, after all, None of our senators or congressmen go anywhere without permission from the president. They don't understand how our system works. We need much more transparency. How did the latest round of sanctions actually come about? What is that really about? What is the relationship between the administration and Congress, between Democrats and Republicans? We need to be in dialogue with Russians in order to explain these things. Otherwise, they're simply going to presume it's a mirror image. And let me end on this. If you go back to George Kennan, he says, no Russia. He does talk about containment, though he doesn't mean match them tank for tank. And he talks about having a positive vision. He talks about having ideas that not only Americans, but also Russians and other Europeans can agree with and can believe in. And I want to read you his recommendation word for word from 1946. And I want you to think as I read it to you, how relevant is this today? Does this matter today? Whether we're prepared to do a Marshall Plan or not, does this vision still matter, and would it still work in U.S.-Russia relations, given all that I've said? 
So Kennan writes, we must formulate and put forward for other nations a much more positive and constructive picture of the sort of world we'd like to see than we have put forward in the past. Europeans are tired and frightened by experiences of the past, and they're less interested in abstract freedom than in security. It is about the degree to which the United States can create among the peoples of the world generally the impression of a country that knows what it wants, that is coping successfully with the problems of its internal life and the responsibilities of a world power, and that has a spiritual vitality capable of holding its own among the major ideological currents of the time. Surely, he concludes, there was never a fairer test of national quality than this. In light of these circumstances, the thoughtful observer of Russian-American relations will find no cause for complaint in the Kremlin's challenge to American society. I think every word of that applies just as much today as in 1946. And I'll end by saying, don't take my word for it. Visit Russia yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. You matter, too, and we appreciate it. We're going to take a break now. We will resume at 10 minutes of 11. That will give us 30 minutes for the break. And don't forget to bring your cards with your questions to one of us standing in the front. Thank you. <laughs>
could get my hat for this. <laughs> Start? You want me to start now? Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. We'd like to start the Q and A now. Okay. Can you hear me? All right. I don't know how this works. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Many people asked, what should the US do to deter Russian interference in our elections? Well, so uh, first of all, thank you again for having me here. And thanks to all of you who came back after the q and I guess I didn't. Before the q and uh, Before the q and I, I guess I didn't drone on quite too long. Um, you know, for, for the Russian side, that's, uh, you know, similar to the, the famous question, how long have you been beating your child, right? It's sort of, well, the Russians deny categorically that they did anything, and they still do, they still do. Um, most famously, just a month ago, uh, when Putin and Trump met, and Trump, uh, we don't know, we don't have a transcript, but Trump uh, says he confronted Putin, and Putin categorically denied it twice, and they continue to deny it. So. Uh, the first question is just establishing uh, what happened. And the reason that that's important for deterrence is in order to deter, you have to do a couple things. Uh, first, you have to define what it is that you're seeking to deter. So if we simply say, if we just offer vague blandishments, say, oh, Russians need to stop intervening in our democracy. Well, what does that mean? If the intervention that we're talking about is that you know, a guy in a black hat named Boris came in and tinkered with the election, the voting apparatus, that's one thing. If the intervention we're talking about is that Russian state-sponsored media broadcasts falsehoods about the United States, that's entirely another thing. Um, and so my answer to the question, what do you do to deter Russia, is it depends. I told you I wouldn't give you a straight answer. It, it depends on what it is you want to deter. I think if we want to deter what would be illegal activity, whether it was done by a foreign government or by an American, that is deterrable in the same way that all kinds of illegal activity is deterrable. Just make it clear what is the unacceptable, what is the red line, right? So is it messing with our voting systems? Is it hacking into party servers or hacking into the voting rolls, the lists? Uh, and, and, and specify what the punishment's going to be, and make sure that the punishment that you pick is a sufficiently deterrent punishment. Uh, I think one of the problems is if we're ambiguous and vague about either what we're trying to deter or how bad and what the punishment will be or the connection between those two things, either because the punishment comes much later or there's a big political debate about exactly what we're punishing. Are we punishing them for election intervention or are we punishing them for their bad record on human rights, right? A radically different thing. So if you say that, well, it's a punishment for everything because they're just bad, then you're not, you're not really deterring anything specific. You're just saying you're bad, right? Sort of like parenting 101, you know, you don't, don't do that. Um, and, then the, and then the second thing you might be trying to deter, I think, is probably not deterrable. And that is if we're trying to deter Russians from saying false and bad things about us, in our democracy and our foreign policy, we probably can't deter that. Uh, for the same reason, they're not going to stop us from saying what we think about them and their system. Why didn't the U.S. confront Russia more forcefully when it boldly annexed Crimea and entered Ukraine? Well, uh, again, that's another one of those wh why didn't you questions. I think the Obama administration uh, would say probably we did, we did. Uh, so, first of all, uh, Russia goes into to Crimea, the little green men, uh, the more or less uh, sham referendum in which Crimea declares independence and then immediately asks to be admitted to the Russian Federation, 
you know, how can you have a free and fair referendum when there are a bunch of Russian soldiers with Kalashnikovs standing outside the voting booth? Um, so the United States didn't recognize Russia's action. It didn't recognize the so-called secession of Crimea. And when the Obama administration was posed with this, this challenge, um, you know, it had a number of policy options. So most extreme would be what? We'll send in the 101st Airborne to liberate Crimea, right? I mean, 20,000 Russian troops there. It's basically in Russia's backyard. Obviously, that's a non-starter. We weren't going to send troops. Uh, you know, option two, uh, arm the Ukrainians, let the, encourage the Ukrainians to go in militarily, take back Crimea. Well, you know, something like two-thirds of the Ukrainian military personnel who were stationed in Crimea when given the opportunity to either leave, put down their weapons and leave, or join the Russian military, they joined the Russian military. So not exactly like friendly territory for the Ukrainians themselves to go in and, and take it back by force, not to mention that Russia is you know, vastly more powerful than Ukraine. So what are we left with, right? Saying tisk tisk tisk, you know, and doing nothing uh, or sanctions. And, you know, we went with sanctions. And so I think uh, while it's imperfect and it certainly didn't uh, work to reverse Russia's action, given the menu of options at the time, it was among the least bad. And if you think of foreign policy like medicine, the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm, at least we didn't make a bad situation radically worse. Though I think morally a lot of people are, are very unsatisfied with that, and I understand that. How long can Russia remain a major power in Europe with its diminished oil revenues eroding its economy? Indefinitely. Uh, how long can Russia remain a, a major power? I think uh, the worst, there, there are various schools of thought on Russia. Uh, there is the, the kind of Cold War, right, us versus them. There is the, uh, you know, alliance with Russian reform. That is, you know, we pick winners, we pick Democrats, we pick friends in Russia, and we support them. And then there is what I call the waiting for Godot school of, of Russian strategy, and that's, well, they're going to collapse eventually, right? We do enough sanctions, we do enough pressure, we, we wait around long enough, and we'll no longer have a Putin problem or a Russia problem. And uh, I think that's just wrong. I, I think Russia is, one way or another, always going to be there, and it is always going to be a key actor. Again, it may not be sufficient to solve whatever the problem is we're facing, even when that problem was created by Russia. And the Ukraine problem was very much exacerbated, at least, by Russia. And now Russia alone is not sufficient to solve that problem. That is a European problem across the board, and it's one that involves the United States, too. Um, and Russia is always going to be at the table. But you asked specifically about, you know, Russia's energy revenue. Russia, Russia has been poorer than it is today and still an important actor on, on the world stage and the European stage. Uh, and, and I think the arc that we are likely to see, you know, we experts, this prediction is worth what you paid for it, but, uh, you know, Russia's ability to weather the current economic storm when you consider its, its currency reserves, when you consider the progress it's made in the last 10 or 15 years, and when you consider just uh, the sheer scale of Russian resources, I think Russia is going to have the ability to project power in Europe and Eurasia and its neighborhood for the foreseeable future, irrespective of what happens in Russian politics. Could you, could, could we accurately describe Putin's self-styled mission as make Russia great again? Yeah. What's the similarity there? Huh? <laughs> No, he, I, I, just, I just would add to that, um, you know, he doesn't have a hat, but uh, yet um, he prefers to wear less clothing rather than more. <laughs> but um, I, think, I, think, I think Putin's, uh, much of Putin's messaging and his image and uh, his, his whole kind of symbolism has evolved over time, but one absolute consistency in it has been the identification of what he does on the world stage and pride in Russia as a great world power. 
Uh, and if you contrast it to, I didn't show you the images, but you all remember them. If you contrast it to Boris Yeltsin in the 1990s, you know, stumbling off the airplane or not even being able to get off the airplane, uh, I think even just the Putin machismo is part of that. This is a guy we can be proud of. He's a tough and a strong guy, and he represents us well. So absolutely, making Russia great again. What keeps you up at night about Russia? <laughs> Well, um, you know, the red-eye air travel is probably the first one. <laughs> but um, if they would just move Russia so it was a little more convenient. Um, I, I think most of all it is, it is the nuclear equation. Um, you know, there's this, uh, uh, I think it's the Physicians for Social Responsibility have the five minutes to midnight. Yeah. Or, yeah. or uh, no, it's a, it's a bulletin of the atomic scientists. That's what it is. Sorry. Uh, and, you know, they've been moving. Uh, sometimes they, they dial it back. After the Cold War, they dialed it back. But they've been moving the minute hand closer to midnight. And I think that's, that's right. We are closer to, we are in a conflict with Russia. We are in a conflict with Russia. I want to say that clearly. We are not yet in a war with Russia. However, the risk of that conflict inadvertently becoming militarized uh, is very high. It's very significant now. And I, I showed you some of the images of the, these near-miss incidents. I didn't show you the cases where Russians intentionally buzz American ships or aircraft coming within very close range, or where we and the Russians come close to one another's airspace as a way of testing each other's readiness. This is really dangerous stuff. It's not like that happens and then instantly we're at DEFCON 5. But when you're in an atmosphere of heightened tension and something unpredictable happens, like a revolution in Ukraine, right? Or, I don't know, let's say maybe the leader of Kazakhstan, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, who's been in power for 26 years, and there's not really a succession plan. What if he dies, right? This is physically the largest former Soviet republic, aside from Russia, right on Russia's border. There's a $100 billion U.S. energy investment in the... Caspian Pipeline Consortium running partially through Kazakhstan. I mean, in other words, there are plenty of other shoes that are yet to drop and things that we could never anticipate, we could never predict, like, you know, an election meddling uh, scheme or something. Whatever it is, or, or, you know, we roll up another one of these Russian spy rings in the United States and we find out one of the spies was, you know, a high-ranking U.S. official or something. I mean, things will happen. And when you're in an atmosphere of heightened tension, that's where you risk crossing the line. Uh, because you already are oriented towards conflict. And once you, I, I'm not a big believer in the idea that uh, direct war between Russia and the United States is containable. There are people who disagree with me on this in Washington that you can have limited war. Uh, you can do even limited nuclear war. I, I tend not to see that as a rational calculation. I think once we're in the realm of a nuclear conflict with, uh, with, Russia, that basically that's doomsday. Okay, I'm going to ask a question, which is not on the list because having grown up in Washington, D.C. during the Cold War, when, when I heard a siren, I wondered if this was it, and you say, now we're in heightened tension with Russia. Can you backpedal and explain how we're in heightened, why are we in tension well, with I, Russia I, now. I thought, Carlin, I thought you were going to ask, now that I live up in the Upper Valley, how far does the fallout go? <laughs> the, the answer is, I don't know and I'd rather not test it. Um, I know we're in the blast radius in Washington. Um, I, think, I think that, you know, I, I told some of this in my lecture, but I think the, the biggest precipitating factor for the current conflict uh, has been and still is Ukraine. And I talked about some of the reasons why Ukraine matters so much. Um, I think we have presumed, because from the vantage point of the comfortable, prosperous United States, it has looked like it's true, that we have a system since 1991 that works. You know, in the Cold War, we had a highly imperfect system, but it worked. It worked. Mutually assured destruction worked. And my evidence for that statement is that we are breathing, right? But since 91, we have also presumed that we had a system that worked. But if you were in Russia in 93 or in 99 
watching the bombing of Yugoslavia, or in 2011 watching the uh, military elimination of the Gaddafi regime in Libya, or in 2012, 13, watching the rise of ISIS in Iraq and Syria. If you're watching that from someplace other than the comfortable, prosperous United States, you might be forgiven for thinking there is no system. There are no rules. It doesn't work. It's broken. And the world is a dangerous and chaotic place where only force, only power can protect you. So why are we in a conflict with the Russians today? Because we see the world really differently, despite some fundamental similarities in our values and our outlook that I talked about. We, we, we see the world today very, very differently. But they feel threatened by us? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Matt, you seem to be advocating a more dovish approach to Russia, but there seems to be a more sinister aspect, cybercrime, Crimea, spying, etc. Can you comment? Look, I, I absolutely reject this sort of hawk-dove framework. I think it's an oversimplification, like everything else in our politics, uh, that lends itself to polarization and hyper-partisanship, and it's just useless. Uh, George Kennan, for instance, was he a hawk or a dove? The guy invented containment, right? The guy never described the Soviet regime as anything other than an adversary. But compared to, you know, Paul Nitze, uh, he was a dove. He opposed NATO enlargement in the 1990s because he said it was going to cause a, a crisis with the Russians, and he was right. Um, I think the, the smart U.S. policy towards Russia today, there isn't a perfect one. There is definitely not one which causes the Russians to see the world radically differently, right? As I, as I said, our job is to understand how they think, not to make them think differently. But I think the smart U.S. policy towards Russia, uh, John McLaughlin, a former director of the CIA, had a very good piece in the New York Times uh, a couple of days ago where he said the first thing is we've got to know what we want. We have to know what our interests are. And I think we've sort of fallen asleep at the wheel on that one for 25 years. Uh, it's been sort of a kick the can down the road. Well, we'll figure out what our vision is. We'll figure out what we want. We'll figure out how we can solve problems when it comes to it. Um, and so I go back to Kennan on that as well, which is it's not about being a hawk or a dove towards Russia. It's about having a clear vision of who we are, what do we stand for, how do we solve problems, telling the Russians that they're wrong over and over while we have less than a compelling or credible story of our own uh, is not going to convince anyone, Americans, Russians, or Europeans. So again, I really, I don't think it's about not hitting the Russians hard enough for bad things that they do so much as not having a compelling answer when they criticize us. Could you speak a bit more on the role of NATO enlargement in the re-energized anti anti-West hostility of the Russian government elite. And back to Cannon, didn't Cannon predict that that would be the case if we actively enlarged NATO? So problem number one is that experts are not good at making predictions. Problem number two is when we make predictions that are right, nobody listens anyway. Um, and and Kennan was, was crystal clear about, about what was likely to come of NATO's enlargement. And his analysis was correct, which is that there will be, um, not necessarily in the sense of tit for tat, but in a kind of building dark storm clouds on the horizon sense, there will be a significant Russian response, and we won't like it. And that is exactly what happened. But there is another side of the story, and I think that's very important to, to tell here and acknowledge. And that is that in the 1990s, um, we were looking at you know 100 million people in Central and Eastern Europe who had just come out from under the yoke of Soviet-backed uh, communism and essentially of the Russian Empire that was re-manifest as the Soviet Union. And these were countries like uh, Poland and Hungary and Bulgaria and Slovakia and the Baltic states, you know, which had been independent prior to World War II and were, were controlled and dominated by the Soviet Union. And not only were we looking for a way to ensure for our geopolitical reasons their independence, their continuing sovereignty, uh, but also to encourage them down the path to democracy, the free market, and reform, none of which was easy. None of this happened. It was easier in those countries than in Russia, for sure, but none of it happened automatically. And one of the ways in which NATO enlargement was used was as a kind of sometimes a gateway drug, if you will, to the European Union and to membership in the family of kind of Western democracies and prosperous free market countries. 
And I think it was important that we offered that prospect to the, the former Warsaw Pact states and the former communist bloc states to say, look, you can, we will formally make you part of the club if you pursue these reforms. And indeed, one of the, one of the qualifying uh, requirements for NATO was being a democracy, having civilian control of your military. These are all countries that for half a century, you know, had Soviet looking guys with big shoulder boards, you know, controlling their respective militaries. Um, so all of these things were very important, and, and that, that is a success story. There's no question it's a success story. I would even add that specifically the NATO Article 5, which is an attack against one, is an attack against all, that this security guarantee was important for empowering uh, moderate reformist voices in these countries. Because remember, every one of these former, former communist countries had, you know, a, a sort of revanchist, communist, and a nationalist camp, as well as a kind of uh, pro-Western liberal reformist camp. And by offering the security guarantee of the United States, it says the United States will not allow you to be once again conquered and annexed and taken back into uh, the Russian sphere. That empowered the reformist voices who said smart things. They didn't always win, and they didn't always, they weren't always brave. But when they were, they could do smart things, uh, including, and this is increasingly important uh, in, for instance, the Baltic states, which have very large ethnic Russian populations, including ensuring the proper treatment of the Russian minorities in countries which overnight went from being part of the same country, the Soviet Union, as Russia, to then becoming independent nations in which, you know, you suddenly find yourself holding a passport to a country that doesn't exist, you know, you speak a language which is not the national language of the country anymore. Uh, the military of your new homeland is aiming its guns at, you know, your parents or grandparents over the border. So how you treat these minorities and whether you have the confidence living in a small country like a Latvia or an Estonia to know you're not going to lose your sovereignty so you can be less hostile towards what might otherwise be thought of as a fifth column. So all of this is a long way of saying the NATO security guarantee has a very positive role and a positive story. But George Kennan is also right, that it is very much at the origin of the problem that we have with Russia. What is the state of environmental degradation in Russia today? What laws do they have in place to rectify these problems? And how aggressively does the state address these issues? It's better and worse than you might think. So. <laughs> It's, it's worse in the sense that when you see the devastation of, you know, the ghost cities and villages, these places that used to be um, like one factory towns, but that were economically unsustainable after the collapse of the Soviet government and its subsidies, and you see the condition in which these places were abandoned, both the human and environmental impact of that is incalculable, right? I mean, you like leave a ton of asbestos and heavy metals and horrible chemicals out exposed to the elements and basically you poison, the, you salt the earth, right? And, and that happened in countless places. Um, in the 1990s when people were, uh, you know, suffering so much that it was a, a no-brainer to rape their own natural resources in order to regain some semblance of decency in life, you can imagine that, you know, like, what mountaintop removal coal mining in West Virginia pales in comparison to the sorts of things that were done in Russia and the former Soviet countries to extract natural resources. And um, even Soviet infrastructure projects like the irrigation of, of southern Siberia and Central Asia, which dried up uh, the Aral Sea, which is no longer a sea, it's like a puddle now. Um, I mean, the, the devastation is kind of beyond what you can imagine. On the other hand, you go to Lake Baikal today and it's pristine. Uh, the Soviet government, the Russian government then afterwards protected that resource. Um, in Moscow, you had better not litter in Moscow. Don't litter in Moscow. All right? Just trust me. Um, <laughs> uh, there, was a, there was a huge protest when the Russian, the, the Moscow city government and the Russian uh, federal government sought to build a highway through what's called the Khimki Forest north of Moscow. Huge protest, and the government listened and they stopped. They eventually did build the highway. There's always a kind of element of that to the story, right? Boris Berezovsky gets out of Russia and then winds up dead. Um, so, you know, give with one hand, take with the other. But environmental movements are actually 
more often than you might think, are among the most influential um, and independent voices in Russian civil society, which does exist. It's not that there's no civil society. And they often receive state funding. You'd be amazed that the state actually gives grants to environmental NGOs. And, and the reason is because I think the Russians are genuine about making Russia great again. And part of being great is Russia's incredible, beautiful natural environment, its resources. If you walked the so-called Garden Ring uh, in Moscow um, three months ago, as I did, you would have seen an exhibition of the Garden Ring is just a, a ring of um, uh, roads, boulevards uh, that surrounds uh, the center of the city. You would have seen an exhibition of um, Russian photographs of its natural environment, which are unreal. I mean, underwater photographs and Arctic photographs. And, and, and Putin, and I'll, I'll just end on this, I mean, Putin himself, right? We make fun of the shirtless, you know, scuba diving and, and flying in a hang glider with cranes. And, but almost all of it is directly tied to the beauty of Russia's uh, natural environment. And uh, he would probably describe himself as Russia's, uh, you know, conservation advocate in chief. Could you explain more about the Secretary of Defense who is widely regarded as Putin's successor? Oh, okay. What yeah. is he like? What relations does the U.S. have with him? Yeah, so uh, this guy, Shoigu, uh, he's currently Russia's Minister of Defense, which is, a, a, in this case, a, a uniform uh, position. So he sort of is the top of all the Russian military uh, infrastructure. And he is uh, a, a trusted confidant of Putin, but he comes from a radically different background than uh, most of the elite around Putin. He has not personally been, uh, as far as we know, either part of the KGB uh, or um, uh, sort of a financial oligarch uh, or uh, really even a, a military power broker because he was a fireman. I mean, he was a, a firefighter, and he rose um, in Yeltsin's time to be the first chief of the Ministry of Emergency Services, which does fire and medical relief and all, all kinds of other emergency services in Russia. And I mean, it's kind of like in America, right? I mean, who, who's against firemen, right? They're heroes, right? So he has risen through the ranks in a way untainted by politics or, um, you know, the sort of the dark aspect of state security and so forth. And uh, he's a little bit younger than Putin. He's from uh, Tuva in Siberia, which is a Buddhist republic. Um, Russia's federation, like the United States, so they have these sort of semi-autonomous republics. They're not very autonomous, but they're, they're somewhat. And um, so he has, in some ways, the right kind of political profile. Um, but again, you know, my prediction's not worth much here. It's just that in the current Russian political landscape, if you had to pick someone who was the most plausible as a successor, a lot of people in the know will tell you, look at Shoigu. And of course, um, being Minister of Defense in an atmosphere like today, where so many big issues have a military conflict twinge to them from the U.S. relationship, right? They see us as the enemy. And, uh, and you know, we give them plenty of reason, unfortunately. Uh, and then they look at crises like Iran and North Korea and Afghanistan. Those are all closer to them than they are to us. And so if we're worried about them, they're also worried about them. And so the Minister of Defense is a kind of calming presence. He is, he is the guy to whom Russians look, as, along with Putin, as their protector. And uh, if that has worked well for Putin, it would work well for Shoigu, too, in theory. Could a Russia-China alliance alliance emerged to provide a yet more dominant influence in Asia? A Russia-China a Russia axis has emerged. There is a Russia-China axis. It's been, its consistency has been imperfect. Um, and it's, and it's, its voice, its strength in various fora, like the UN Security Council, where Russia and China typically vote together. Uh, it, it's fluctuated over time. There have been a few instances where the Russians and the Chinese have parted ways. I mentioned the case of the separatist regions of Georgia, where the Russians asked the Chinese to recognize them as independent, and the Chinese said no. Um, Russia and China don't have a military alliance, per se. They have, in fact, fought wars in Soviet times over territory along the Russian-Chinese border. It's uh, among the longest borders in the world. 
um, the relative development and population of northern China versus southern Siberia is such that the Russians are very nervous about the Chinese effectively creepingly taking over Siberia with its vast natural resource wealth. But on the other hand, as soon as Western sanctions came into effect, including energy sanctions in 2014, Putin went to China and negotiated a half trillion dollar gas deal with the Chinese, so which hasn't yet been fulfilled, but on the other hand, it's there, and as I said, energy is fungible. So if they're not going to sell it to us, they'll sell it to the Chinese. Uh, so I think the relationship is real. The axis of power there is real. The idea that the Russians and the Chinese have common interests in breaking an American monopoly on sort of setting the rules of the game, the Chinese would absolutely agree with that. And there's even, I think, a troubling uh, analogy between where the Russians have reasserted military force as the primary measure of national power in the European theater, right? So think about Georgia, Crimea, Eastern Ukraine, Syria. Um, what, are the, what are the Chinese doing in the South China Sea, right? They're sending their navy with naval engineers to build artificial islands to claim, you know, ocean territory, to claim um, territorial waters, which are also claimed by mostly American allies. Uh, and, and other countries like Vietnam, which, you know, becomes a sort of football between China and the United States. Um, so I think for now the Russians and Chinese exist in a kind of, um, in a kind of uh, alliance of convenience on many issues that may not last. China's economic relationship with the United States is such that if you put a binary question to them, they would never want to have to answer this question of who do you choose? Russia or the United States, you know, that's a tough, tough one for the Chinese. But the Chinese very much like uh, Putin is, if you go to any bookstore in China, and I've done this, you will find multiple Chinese language biographies, biographies of Vladimir Putin with a big picture of Putin on the front. He's one of the most popular political figures in China. I think we have room for one more, maybe more. but. You have broadly addressed what the U.S. needs to do to reset our relationship to Russia. As a practical matter, where do we start given our current political situation? Well, start by not calling it a reset. That's for sure. Um, that's, that's, that's already been done. And also, I think a recognition of reality. A colleague of mine um, has written a book uh, called The Limits of Partnership, which the thesis of which is essentially the U.S.-Russia relationship happens in cycles. And it does happen in cycles. And it happens in cycles for a very sim uh, simple reason that I, that I got into in the lecture, which is as the relationship worsens uh, progress in multiple areas, we always, it's a stupid idea, but we always do it, we freeze our dialogue, we freeze our cooperation. And what that means is you get lots of areas of either urgent necessity, like security, or mutual interest where there's a backlog of opportunities that we simply don't pursue, as well as a backlog of problems. And when you freeze the relationship, as we always do for two, three, four years, 10 years, whatever it is, that backlog builds up. And then someone comes along and calls it a reset or calls it you know, a strategic partnership, as the George W. Bush administration called it. Call it whatever you want. And then you build some institutions, like a bilateral commission or whatever, which is basically just diplomacy. And you, you announce a new policy, which every administration does. You start doing diplomacy, which every administration thinks it, it wants to do. And you have this backlog of relatively low-hanging fruit. And we're building up that backlog right now. In, in the wake of the Ukraine crisis, we imposed isolation on Russia, and we imposed sanctions. And they've done counter-sanctions and counter-isolation. So we're building up all these problem areas. And that's fine. Cycles are fine. The only problem with cycles is that sometimes you do permanent damage during a downswing. And what I hope is that we don't cross that line. As long as we don't cross that line and go to war with each other and destroy the world, then fine. We'll just wait around for the next cycle. And so it's, it's our job in the meantime to make sure that we don't cross that line. So we cross our fingers, we go to church. I mean. No, no, you, you, you know something about Russia. So that's why, you know, 
foreign policy, there's a misapprehension because so much does ride on what our government does or doesn't do that foreign policy is made exclusively by governments. It is not. Uh, I have a, a, a mentor, a former colleague, uh, Hal Saunders, who was Kissinger's aide on the shuttle diplomacy in the Middle East. He was an assistant secretary of state, a brilliant and a good man. He passed away a couple of years ago. And his, his um, stock in trade was what he called sustained dialogue. It's another way of saying track two diplomacy. And he always said, the reason you do track two, track two as distinct from track one, is diplomacy done by citizens is that foreign policy is not made by one guy sitting in a room, like Vladimir Putin or Donald Trump or anybody else. Foreign policy is made by whole bodies politic, and that includes all of us. Because think about it. All of us can call Congress. We can write uh, articles for our newspaper. We talk to our friends. We uh, post things on social media. I don't know, you, maybe you don't all have Facebook accounts, but you know, pretty much everybody under 30 now lives on social media. I mean, foreign policy is made by whole bodies politic. And so what can we do about it? We can all do what I said. Those were not just prescriptions for government. Know something about Russia, provide support for Russian area studies and expertise here at Dartmouth College, uh, around the country. We need it in the United States. Um, make sure that we have opportunities for direct engagement, right? So don't accept the idea that we're going to cut off visas for Russians because they cut off visas for us. I, that's stupid. I said, let Russians come in the country. If they're criminals, if they're spies, you know what? Our security authorities will know about that and we'll stop them. Let's give visas to Russians, for sure. Um, and then, of course, we've got to know what we want. What do we want to get out of Russia? And determining what we want as a society is another collective exercise, right? Again, it's not one person or even 535 people on Capitol Hill who decide what it is that we want. We need to know what we want. We need to know why problems matter to us like Ukraine or Syria or Iran's or North Korea's nuclear program. And we have to be very clear with the Russians about what we want. And I think part of the exercise of negotiation is give and take. And so we also have to be prepared to say what is it that we're going to offer. Um, and, and I think when we put unrealistic expectations and requirements on our elected officials, and again, that's part of all of, all of our roles, when they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't, that's when we end up with a dysfunctional policy, right? We hold them responsible for making the concessions that are necessary to make to keep us safe, right? Uh, or to grow our economy and gain, gain access to world trade. We, we see this all the time, right? How dare you let this American company relocate jobs to Mexico or whatever it may be? Well, that's part of the price of admission to the global economy, which has also benefited us so much, right? We put these unrealistic, double-edged sword kind of requirements on, on our government, and they can't conduct diplomacy. Um, so I would say there are a whole lot of things we can do, but it definitely starts with knowing Russia. Go to Russia if you can get a visa. Thank you so much. Thank you.